Um, so I was asked to um, present, thank you for asking me to present this morning. It's, um, <coughs> very inspirational speeches from yesterday and, and listening to people's stories. Um, so I was asked to talk about organisational approaches to reducing restrictive interventions. Um, thank you. Um, it's quite a broad title. Um, but I think probably one of the things that I would like to share is that this is uh, probably my musings of, of, of my experience of working in organisations. Um, my current role around national leads for behaviour support with the National Autistic Society, I'm actually at the end of week five, so I'm still trying to work out what it is I'm going to be doing. Um, so some of this is really a reflection of some of the clinical roles that I've had, um, and my previous role was actually a lecturer at um, a university as well. So some of the evidence base around what, what's being said around reducing restrictive interventions. So briefly, I'm going to look at, at what we mean by defining restrictive um, practices. Um, I'm not going to go labour too much about what we actually mean by that, but actually about maybe some of the contextual issues that there is around the definitions. Um, looking at some of the evidence-based approaches, looking at organisational frameworks, and maybe a bit about what we do around action planning to start to move things forward. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask you to keep in mind is a... Um, this definition throughout. I'm going to come back to this definition near the end of the presentation. Um, and some of it is to do with terminology, and I think we, we start to forget about what do we actually mean by a reactive strategy. Um, and Gary Lavinia talks about, I mentioned him a couple of times, I'm a little bit of a hero worshipper when it comes to Gary Lavinia's work. Um, so he's from the Institute of Applied Behaviour Analysis, if people aren't familiar with his work. And really what he's saying is that when we're in a crisis situation, the only purpose of a reactive strategy is to get rapid and safe control over the situation. It has absolutely no responsibility for future behaviour. Um, so I think that's a point that I'd like to labour a little bit later on, if people could uh, bear with me and keep that in mind. So defining restrictive practices. I haven't referenced this because there's that many different uh, definitions just within the UK. So it's really just a summary of, of what's already out there. But rather than just thinking about what we actually define about uh, restrictive practices, is actually to start to think about not just having the definition, but actually some of the issues are around their application and the context in which they're used. And the reason I wanted to labour that point is particularly around once we put a label on something, people start to actually make assumptions around it. So I've, I've been to services where people say, oh, we don't, we don't use physical restraint. We have a hands-off approach. But actually, when we start to delve a little bit deeper, and as uh, certainly in my clinical work, start reading some of the instant reports, is that we supported Jim to his room after an episode in the dining room. What do you mean you supported him? What does that actually mean? And then when we start to look at some of the context, actually what you meant was physical restraint, but you've not actually called it that. So I think there is a bit about not just having a definition, but actually being very, very clear in terms of what we're talking about in the context of what people are actually doing and how they apply that. Again, similar issues around chemical restraint. And there's a bit about that, that kind of bit about the primary purpose around influencing a person's behaviour. Um, one of my previous titles in a clinical post was I, I was a challenging behaviour nurse specialist. It sounded very grand and very... Um, but from a behaviour specialist point of view, actually having that power to influence somebody's behaviour, that's huge. Um, but the context in which we use that power actually becomes very distorted. And that's where some of the issues are around restrictive practices, not just about sticking a label on something, getting some data and saying that we reduce it. We really need to think about some of the things about the context of what people are doing and actually why they're doing it. Again, mechanical restraint, it is that bit about the context. So it's not around therapeutic approaches, but actually the context that we use in terms of influencing people's behaviour. Uh, definition of seclusion, isolation of a person. Um, I used to, 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 to um, I and mean, certainly some of the services that I worked in and community services, is that people would say, we don't do seclusion. People have this view that seclusion happened in the assessment and treatment services in a purpose-built room with lots of um, you know, kind of equipment and video cameras and continuous observations. But actually, if we look at some of the definitions that are out there, that can actually happen anywhere. But it's probably not been recorded as being that. So I think it was quite interesting yesterday when they were talking about the data that's been collected. Um, Norman Lamb was discussing it, and I think he felt a bit disheartened by the increase. I do wonder if some of that data is actually we've actually increased awareness and we've actually got better at recording, which I actually find quite. Um, quite a positive thing rather than being disheartened by the increase in the data. So I, I, th I think that's um, quite a positive thing. The other bit is, is in terms of other restrictive interventions. Um, and I'm not sure as organisations that we're very clear about some of the, the things that are actually happening. So things like social restraints, you can't go to this activity because of something that happened this morning. We're actually restricting people's lives and having a huge influence in terms of their quality of life by some of the practices we adopt. But we haven't got a label for us, so we don't record it anywhere. So I think the challenge for people today when you leave is actually to start thinking about what are we actually doing in response to crisis 
and actually in terms of, of improving somebody's quality of life or actually is it more, more restrictive for the individual and how do we start recording that? If we don't know that people are doing something then we actually can't address what the problem is. So in terms of the impact of, of um, um, restrictive interventions, most of us um, in some capacity, whether we're lecturers or we work for, for civil service or we're, or we're still um, clinicians, the aim of what we want to do in terms of our services in some shape or form is actually around improving people's quality of life. We actually want people to be living within a community or, or within a school, having friends, uh, being going to lessons, actually feeling good about themselves, feeling empowered and becoming valuable members of society. So no matter what job we have, actually that's really what we want to try and achieve for people. But actually in the terms of the impact of restrictive interventions, the actual process of doing that and what we're actually doing to people actually contradicts that. Um, what we're doing in terms of restrictive interventions is we're not including people, we're excluding them. We're not developing positive relationships with people, we're actually making people feel frightened of us, which actually usually comes out of what we would describe as they're very angry or dysfunctional, but actually people are becoming scared of us because of what, because of what we do. We restrict people's opportunities to participate in activities. I very often hear in services, I think it's maybe just some of the clinical work that I've done, is that I hear a term, he just needs to learn to wait. He needs to learn that he can't do that. Yes, people that we work with who are very complex do need to learn these skills, but actually where do we provide the life opportunities for them to learn? If people are excluded from, from things, uh, from their peer group, how do they actually learn to, um, to have these skills? People's physical, emotional well-being, um, and as I said, learning new skills in terms of being able to cope with these things. What we do know is that actually, we, there, there's um, a wide body of research in terms of the level of injury um, regarding restraint, but actually the emotional harm and trauma that we actually cause to people um, is, is, is well documented as well. And actually that disruption of relationships. So for me as a clinician coming in to say, I'm here to help you, I'm your support worker today, but actually then we're involved in an incident. How do you rebuild that relationship and those number of hours that we have with people? We know from people's lived experiences that they, they experience pain and discomfort and actually feel they're being targeted by the use of, um, of restraint. Um, and people have had very little information about it. So actually people come to our service and things just happen. So we might have a lot of easy read materials, but actually how do we explain the context of what we're doing and why we're doing it? I'm here to help you. That's my role as your support worker, but I will be involved with four other people actually holding you on the ground when you become distressed, when your behaviour, at your lowest point, when you're actually the most distressed, this is how I'm going to respond to you. Uh, I'm not sure that any easy read material makes, would uh, make sense of that to anybody. Uh, or maybe I just haven't read the right material yet. Uh, some people looked at their experiences um, as, as being shameful and being isolated and ignored. So again, if we think of the trauma that people actually go through when this happens, what happens afterwards? Our policies say that we have a debrief, but actually what does that look like for the individual? Do they feel debriefed? Um, and while some participants in, in a later study said they could actually see why restrictions were there in terms of keeping people safe, um, I could understand the context of that. Actually, when it boiled down to it, I was going, I understand that that might be needed. I understand why I have that policy. But see, when I'm distressed, that's not going to help me to calm down. So it's not very person-centered. <laughs> so evidence-based approaches. I'm not sure why the S was there, because I'm actually only going to talk about one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, positive behaviour support. Okay, there's, there's, there's a number of definitions of positive behaviour support. Um, I like this one. It's a bit, I think with sometimes the definitions of positive behaviour support, it's a bit like, uh, who's your favourite Doctor Who? So there's, are we on the 12th Doctor now? Any Doctor Who fans? I think we're on 12. Somebody might correct me later. Um, and I think there is a little bit about, we can't say that one's not the real Doctor because they're all the Doctor, we know that. I know it's a fictional program for those of you that are concerned about somebody needs to have a word with her later. Um, anyway, my favourite doctor is Tom Baker. He's, he's the best. That's who I grew up with. Uh, and I think that's a little bit about positive behaviour support. This is my favourite definition of positive behaviour support. Um, it's the one I grew up with. The other thing I like about this definition is that um, some of the definitions I see around positive behaviour support, um, when I've seen them being presented to an audience, I see people going, oh, that sounds very interesting, but that sounds hard. Um, there's lots of words in it, so they're very wordy. This one actually does what it says on the tin. And I think there's been some discussions around where does positive behaviour fit in terms of services? It's just for learned disability services. It's just for services where you're involved with people long term. It's not for, for services where we only see people on an intermittent basis. And I think if you took the word disabilities out of this, this definition, I think I would challenge anybody here not to say that the principles and values of that statement don't fit with their service. Because actually in terms of... of values and promoting the rights of individuals that we work with with a practical science 
about learning about how, how to develop new skills and how behaviour actually occurs, I don't think anybody in this room would disagree with that. And what we want as an outcome of that process is improvements in people's quality of life. That's what we want for individuals. Um, we want it to be based on a functional analysis, which is the evidence base about this is what my intervention is. Um, we all know that quick fix solutions actually don't work for the people that we're supporting. So we need multi-component interventions. We need to, to empower people to have the skills to learn how to wait, to cope with difficult situations without using um, behaviour that would be perceived as challenging. And we want to build capable environments because actually we don't want people constantly getting re-referred back to our services. We want to build um, a capable network of support for individuals in the community. So I think in terms of, of um, positive behaviour support being applicable across services, I think if we use this definition, it does reflect that. In terms of outcomes of positive behaviour support is that we're very constructive in our approach. Actually, we're not starting to think about, I need you to stop doing that behaviour before I can support you. I need you to stop doing this before I can do my intervention. Um, actually, we start the starting point is, how are we going to improve your quality of life? How are we going to build a confident staff team around you? Because again, where we see things around inconsistency is people becoming unclear about what they're doing, but actually a bit, a bit scared. Um, I've been in services where people are actually terrified. They just want to get through their shift where somebody's not self-harming or doing something and actually almost start to do that. If I can get through the shift and people are safe, they've had their dinner, and, and it's almost those very basic needs that they're meeting for people because actually they're frightened to do anything else. Obviously, we want to see a decrease in aversive and inconsistent approaches. Um, and, but we actually want outcomes that are, that are measurable and sustained. There's a lot of talk about data collection, about what we do in a crisis. Um, and I think there's a bit for me of, to start to challenge service to be a bit more constructive. How are we recording what we do well? And sharing that with each other. We can discuss that over coffee. Um, understanding the purpose of behaviour, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about functional analysis and formulation. But actually my experience has been is that People tend to respond to behaviours based on the form of the behaviour rather than the function. So people presented, for example, with somebody coming towards them, uh, maybe presenting in a very aggressive manner, you don't know the individual very well, might actually start to think, am I going to restrain this person because actually I feel physically threatened. <laughs> Whereas if I actually understand the function of the behaviour, Jim's just come into the room, he's, he's, he's rushing, he, he drove from Essex, I know it wasn't Essex, um, <laughs> this morning and he's rushed and harassed and actually all I know is he just needs a cup of coffee or he wants me to make a joke about uh, Star Trek because they're in Birmingham. So I'm actually responding to the function of his anxiety because I understand where he's coming from, but actually if I don't understand that, I, normally what we do is re respond to the behaviours that we see rather than thinking about what the function of the behaviour is. So I suppose it's that bit of thinking about the functions of behaviours. Don't just say, sometimes I see assessment reports where people go, the function of the behaviour is escape and the function of the behaviour is this. Um, I have tried to think of a different way of saying this, but I can. So I'm, I'm one of those people, I've been talking for 14 minutes, so we're practically lifelong friends now. I'll just say how it is. Um, they're lazy assessments. Uh, and actually they don't, they don't tell me anything about the individual. They don't tell me anything about how I should respond. What we need to ask is what the context. Why would Jim avoid use his behaviour to actually avoid having an interaction with somebody? Why would he use his behaviour to avoid going into the classroom? What's that about? What journey has he been on that he needs to use his self-interest behaviour in order to give me a message? Because actually it's that journey that I need to understand, not just the fact that he doesn't want to be in the classroom or doesn't want to be with people. Uh, I think this diagram is probably used in a lot of different um, context i've changed it a little bit so then um, for people who haven't seen it before we normally have the top of the iceberg bit that you can see and that's the behavior we see and underneath we have the bit of uh, lack of sleep other conditions etc so, so all the context is, is what's going on underneath that you actually can see i've changed this as a challenge to organizations because actually the behaviors that we see in our staff the bit that's underneath there as an organization you need to take responsibility for the structures what are the visions and the values of the organisation and what are the belief systems of the organisation? Because those are very powerful things which influence staff behaviours. So there is a bit about looking what's going on underneath before we actually criticise people. Um, and in terms of, of kind of bringing that together, trying to understand not just the people that we're supporting in terms of their behaviour, but understanding staff's behaviour, we need to understand what that person understands. Why are people using restrictive practices more frequently or quickly than what we would like? Because we've, we've got policies. We're, we, we've been writing policies for a very long time. So there's a reason why we're still not doing it. Why are we still not getting this right? Um, we need to understand more about that. 
you know, I wouldn't have a presentation with those behaviour support plan overview. Um, so the bits that are in blue uh, are is probably a whole other conference that would probably take, I could fill two whole days with those if anybody would like to invite me to do that. I would have a great old time. Um, so when we're talking about proactive strategies, these are all the things that we want to have in place for individuals. So actually that they don't need to use uh, behaviours of concern to, to meet their needs. Um, and I'll just briefly go through those for people who aren't familiar with this model. It's uh, based on the Institute for Applied Behaviour Analysis. So once we've done our assessment and understand uh, things from the individual's perspective, not because I've ticked a few forms and filled in a few ABC charts, I actually understand that person's journey. Then we want to look at what's going on in the person's environment. We want to look at the activities they've got. Where's the life opportunities? That's our point of intervention. What new skills does the person need to learn? Are they able to make a sandwich for themselves? And actually, because those things are actually important, but we're too busy thinking about teaching about your behaviour. But actually, what we might need to be doing is going, actually, you need to learn how to make your own snacks. So you don't need to come to me to help you to do it. We also look at having focus support, which is that bit that I kind of refer to as bridging the gap, because sorting out the environment and teaching people skills, that takes a bit of time. So actually, we might need something around there to, to, to actually bridge the gap before we do that, and also reduces the need for um, um, reactive strategies. So can anybody remember the Gary Lavinia slide from earlier? Yep. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to question you on it. So he talks about reactive strategies in the context of rapid safe control. I think some of the definitions around restrict, uh, reactive strategies got very distorted. I've seen behaviour support plans overviews like this, that under the reactive strategies, I've seen a list of restraint techniques. I've seen a list of medication. I've seen a list. Of, they are not reactive strategies. Actually, they, they're risk management strategies. Take them out of the behaviour support plan and put them somewhere else. Reactive strategies are about de-escalation, redirection. They are person-centred to the individual and not something that's lifted from a menu of things that organisations are, are taught. Um, I, I, chat, I would welcome people's views on this. I wonder, do we need to take reactive strategies out of there altogether and actually put the word resolution? I think it flips the whole context in terms of a crisis incident. How do I react? What's my reactive um, strategy? If I'm going into a crisis situation with the term resolution, how am I going to resolve this? I think it slightly changes the emphasis. But I would welcome people's views on that. Maybe it's just my personal view. Um, so I'm going to share a piece of research that's been done um, um, by um, Matthew Spicer and Nicola Kreitz in Tasmania, because they've actually proved that this works, so it's, it's, you can tell I'm getting terribly excited now. Uh, and they talk about non-aversive restrictive strategies, um, or NARS. So um, they talk about traditional concepts to reactive strategies, and what we tend to do is we get a little bit stuck on the alignment principle. I've kind of mentioned this a little bit already, that actually the more um, serious the behaviour, actually our perception is, is that we need to be more aversive or more restrictive. So it's almost that Here's the top shelf behavior. We need the top shelf uh, strategy rather than thinking about what we're doing. Beliefs around reinforcement. Well, if we do that, we're going to reinforce the behavior and they're more likely to do it the next time. Now, again, this is the, bit, the, the, the iceberg scenario, what's going on underneath. Why do people believe that? Because we've already said reactive strategy is about getting safe control over a situation. It's about resolution. So if giving the person what they want is going to resolve the situation, then why won't you do that? Because we get confused about what reinforcement is and we get confused about resolution and treatment goals. And there's always that belief in justice as well. Uh, people don't explicitly say this, but actually it's almost when you get into that narrative with people, uh, people who behave badly shouldn't get nice things. Because um, that's how we were brought up. So they uh, have done a piece of research which looks at um, using aversive strategies. Their definition is where something that a person would find unpleasant. Mm -hmm. Uh, restrictive practices, uh, which was usually um, a brief manual restraint. They then looked at non-functionally based uh, reactive strategies. So non-functionally based mean is, is the, um, we've got a couple of examples on the next slide. So things like positive resolution, giving the person something, uh, preferred event, um, inject humour, those sorts of things. So not necessarily based on the function of the behaviour. We don't understand what's going on in this crisis, what the person really wants, but actually some of the work that we've done tells us that these sorts of things might work. Uh, and the final one that they looked at were functionally based. We actually have a really good assessment. We understand what this, when this person's in crisis, what the behaviour might mean. So actually, we're going to base our strategies around that. Um, I was a bit worried when I printed this off because something strange has happened to my graphs. So I don't know if on my printed sheets they look strange. Okay, they're not as, as strange as what these are. So I think we can work with that one. So when aversive strategies were used, 47% um, of the time the situation escalated. So we used something aversive, actually it didn't resolve the situation. 47% of the time actually made things worse. 
Um, Matthew talked about this in terms of thinking about how many steps are we, because eventually the situation will be resolved. How many steps are we away from getting there? Um, so are we, are we four steps away? Are we going to escalate, continue, de-escalate, and then finally get to resolution? 10% of the time when we use an aversive, they used an aversive strategy, um, they had resolution. So 47% of the time, actually things got worse when we used an aversive strategy. Using a restrictive practice, 46% of the time, things got worse. So not, not actually much in the, dif in the difference here in terms of what we're doing. We're actually seeing it more likely that things are going to escalate using restrictive practice or reverse of strategies. So that's quite, that's quite powerful. So we're actually going in with the intent of doing something and actually things start to get worse. We can see how quickly when people go from the zero to 100 miles in terms of our response because things get out of control very, very quickly. Using non-functionally based, so we don't really understand what the, um, what the function of the behaviour is, 48% of the time was resolution. It resolved 48%. I like repeating that bit because I, th I think their data is absolutely amazing. I would have references at the end, go, go and read their work. It's absolutely fantastic. 20% um, de-escalated, so the situation still, still, um, is, is still ongoing, but it's actually starting to de-escalate. But actually 48% resolution by using a non-functionally based um, strategy. Does, can anybody guess what's on the next graph? So now we understand and we understand the function of the behaviour and we actually use a strategy that's person-centred, meets the person's needs, that we're fairly confident is actually going to bring around resolution. What percent is it? Shout out anybody. No, it's hundreds, it's hundreds, it's hundreds. <laughs> I love Should we say that, that again? Just... <laughs> When I saw them present this, I was like just beside myself going, oh my, but to actually have an evidence base to back this up, I think this is the first time that we've actually got this. Um, so it's hugely exciting. Go and read their work, they're amazing people. <laughs> so what was I here to talk about? Organisational frameworks, okay, back, back to that. Get away from the, I love a graph that does something like that. Um, so in terms of, I'm not gonna labour the point in this because actually I think there was people yesterday who presented this far more eloquently than what I can do. Um, but what I will talk to you about is where, where we use some of the core strategies within a service and actually start to unpick some of those going, how do we actually, when I come to stuff like this, I, I, I sit there and I'm very inspired by some of the things that, that people say. And then I get them a coffee break and then I go, how do you do that in practice though? What, how can I make that apply to the services that I work in? Um, because I think there are variations in terms of how we would apply it. So in terms of a service that I was working in, in terms of looking at leadership, now one of the things I, I, I think about leadership is that we need to unpick that a little bit. So we know the people that have the titles that indicates that are leaders, and we know the people that sign off our timesheets and our travel claim forms and authorise our annual leave. Um, but in terms of, of actual practice leadership on shift, they're sometimes different people, and I think they get missed out. Um, so I think we need to start widening out what we mean by leadership and being a, it's a bit like how we just find a restrictive practice We've got a nice label of physical restraint, but actually the context of it um, So I think that is a challenge for organizations just to scout out there and go who is the person that actually influences what happens in Practice because they might not always have the title that matches that and we need to make sure we include those people So we looked at commissioning a multidisciplinary team So uh, I think there's that bit about the context of positive behavior support It's not about one individual and it's not about one part of the organization um, giving this team actually autonomy for decision making. So what we don't want is people coming together and agreeing something and then go, right, well, we need to go and check with about 10 different managers to see if we can do this. Trust them to make the right decision and follow that through. Minimum meeting dates, we, we set monthly dates and actually having a very clear role and remit. So just that turning off of, right, we're here about reducing restrictive practices. How are we going to do that? Um, be very practical and actually allow them to develop policies to do that. Using data, so I don't think anybody in this room would disagree with that. The problem that we have with data is that um, quite often, um, yeah, I can't say this. I, I know this is a fact from clinical practice. Forms are not fit for purpose. The amount of times I've gone into a service in clinical practice in my behaviour specialist role and seen an ABC chart um, that's filled in, uh, and, and uh, usually people will put something, going, there were no antecedents, nothing happened before the behaviour, it just, it just, it just appeared. Um, so they're not, fit, you know, they're, they're not fit for purpose in terms of gathering. So people are going to spend time at the end of their shift um, filling in a piece of paper, actually give them something that they can use rather than just um, 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 filling in something that ticks the boxes to meet my needs. Very often in terms of, of behaviours is that we actually don't see, so we have descriptions of behaviours, but actually what we're not measuring is the frequency, duration and severity of the behaviour. And actually those things sometimes um, in terms of our data collection are important things that we want to know about. Um, 
talking about the course of a behaviour. So again, when, when does the early warning sign start? Because actually what we might want to do in terms of what we're recording is we might be still using some restrictive practices, but actually they're happening earlier on and we're interrupting the behaviour cycle. That's important information because actually things don't change overnight. And what we don't want is people saying, oh, we've got our data, but actually all we've done is increase the use of restrictive practices. We're getting it wrong. But actually, if we're recording things like, oh, well, hang on a minute, they're participating more in activities, quality of life's improving, let's keep going, because actually we're seeing some positive things. But I'm not sure we're very good at recording those other things. Um, and being very clear about actually how were situations resolved, <clears throat> not just about gathering data about the number of interventions that we actually use. How did we actually get to the point where we want it to be? In terms of developing a workforce, we need to have tiered training. So there's that bit about every single person in the organisation needs this training. Now, this group of people might need something extra, something extra, something extra, but we actually all have to start with exactly the same starting point. Matching competencies to what people actually do. What do people need to actually learn? The amount of people that are time that's wasted, I'm sure there's studies that have looked at this. Jim, you'll know, you're still at university. Um, <laughs> the amount of money and energy we waste on training, and actually, are we measuring what difference it makes to people's practices? There's tons of research, he'll know about that. Um, active support, again, how, we, we say that people need to be meaningfully engaged in activities that improves their quality of life. Also lots of research on that. But actually trying to engage with somebody that you don't know very well, is very traumatized and very distressed, and perhaps has other, other um, issues around communication or being able to, to follow the sequence of activities. That's quite a hard thing to do. If you think about some of the training our support workers get, besides going on food hygiene and one or two other things, because the world will end if we don't fill in fridge temperature charts, um, we actually don't provide our staff with, with the skills in terms of how to do the job. I'd like to somebody else to have it. Apparently it will. I've been reassured. I have no time to fill in your behaviour recordings, Linda, but a fridge temperature chart or two. I'm not going to be allowed to work in services again on the fridge temperature things. How much time have I got? I'm okay at the moment. Okay. Um, risk assessments in vivo training. So this is a bit about training. Um, actually train people. In, somebody spoke yesterday where they, I think they, they have a kind of mock-up that's a, a copy of the ward, so you know what they need to do. Sir. We need to do that for all the proactive stuff as well. Uh, and we need to be doing the training on site with individuals in real life situations. That, that's where the training needs to happen. It, it works. Uh, looking at root cause analysis and reflective practice. There's a bit about actively including consumers. How do we do that? And I think there's a bit about getting the right form for people. Um, I know certainly a piece of work that we did where we did have quite a big team. Actually, people didn't want to come to a big meeting in the boardroom. Uh, what they wanted us to do was come to their service at six o'clock in the evening and come and have a cup of tea and have a chat about things. So it's about, let's not be tokenistic about stuff. If we want to include people and ask their opinion, then do it in a way that's actually meaningful for them, um, not meaningful for us so we can tick a box and say, we've included our um, people we support. Debriefing, um, yeah, I, I, I think that slide probably speaks for itself. It, it always seems something extra, um, and it needs to become more routine in terms of what we do. It's not negotiable. Um, so in terms of developing an action plan, let's do all these things very short for time, is, is start off by committing an organization, uh, but actually start looking at our baseline data, thinking about what is it we want to record, what do we want to measure. I think if we start off just by saying, we just want to measure restrictive practices and show that we're actually reducing them, I would question the values and the beliefs of an organization, so it's back to the iceberg thing. Actually, we also should be measuring in terms of people's participation um, uh, and, and outcomes for quality of life as well. Those are the things that we need to measure, because those are the things that will actually change. Invest in training. I've talked about one evidence-based approach in positive behaviour support. It's kind of what I do. I know lots about it. I think it's wonderful. Please go read more about it or email me if you want to know more. But there are other evidence-based approaches out there that might fit with the service that you work in. Um, go and find it and be passionate about what it is that you want to do. Looking at quality assurance systems, kind of skipping around to, to number eight, that actually looking at these sorts of things in isolation won't work. What we need to do is actually look at the whole organisation in terms of their values um, and the, the belief systems that they share with their staff. So that, that's, that needs to be measured and, and be very articulate to people as well. And responding to success and opportunities. It's not just about the graphs, seeing things going down. Let's get some graphs with things going up. Look how, um, how much participation people have had. Look how much success people have actually had and share those graphs as well. A couple of final points in terms of how we always think about situations and react to them, because that's what we do. Uh, we respond to something, we think we're being helpful. Um, start thinking about how do we resolve things, because it's a slightly different context. So we, 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 I would suggest waste a lot of energy reacting to things, 
when actual fact we just need to take a little bit of a step back and, and start thinking about resolving. And my final slide is um, from Matthew and Nicola's work as well. So I'd, I would love to claim this was all from this was all mine, but uh, it's not. And they talk about if we're responding to outbursts and aggression with compassion, understanding, and assistance, even if that's meeting the person's needs, that's not reinforcing a problem behaviour within the context of a multi-element support plan. So don't get caught up on those bits about reinforcing. Um, the difficulty that we have and the challenge for us is, is actually to be able to do this requires passion and demands that practitioners are fully committed to the spirit about using non-aversive reactor strategies. And that's the challenge. And I have some references at the end. And we're, I've gained about an extra four minutes for coffee and cake. <laughs> Bonus points. Oh,